morning, everybody. May I invite you to take your seats to start uh, the conference. Uh, I want to welcome this uh, illustrious group that we have here today. Uh, my special welcome goes uh, to our Minister of Finance, uh, Hartwig Löger. Uh, I also want to welcome a good old friend of the Austrian Central, Central Bank, President Jean-Claude Juncker. Uh, Welcome to President Jakob de Haan, dear speakers, dear fellow governors, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It is my pleasure to welcome you at the 46th Economics Conference of the Austrian Central Bank, organized in cooperation with SURF, the European Money and Finance Forum. The title of this conference is Economic uh, uh, economic and Monetary Union, the next, uh, the first and the next 20 years. So two decades after its introduction, the Euro is arguably the most tangled result of the European unification process. It's something that we share with our fellow citizens, uh, as many as 340 million uh, people living in 19 countries of the continent. And since the start of Economic and Monetary Union, the number of Euro area countries has gradually increased from 11 to 19. And as the common European currency, the Euro swiftly established itself as the second most important currency of the world and has come to serve as a stable monetary anchor for most of our neighbors uh, neighboring countries in Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe, and I'm very glad that many of these countries are represented also here at this conference. In a recent survey, 74% of Europeans said they were in favor of EMU with one single currency, the Euro. This is the highest level of support for the Euro area uh, ever recorded. It also testimonies to the success of the Euro system in fulfilling its mandate of price stability and in providing an environment for economic growth and high employment over the past 20 years. It is not by accident that the approval rates uh, for the euro declined when unemployment rose during the recession crisis of 2008 to 2013 and thereafter rebounded significantly when the euro area returned to a path of stable growth. We are, of course, all well aware that the past 20 years have seen one of the worst financial and economic crises at the global level since the 1930s, as well as a second specifically European crisis, which posed a severe threat to the single currency. It was only thanks to the joint efforts of European governments and institutions that the crisis has been overcome. And so the ECB, for its part, has contributed by backstopping the financial system and providing monetary stimulus. The single currency, if you look at it in the historical terms, was not invented as the political symbol, the most uh, tangled result of the European unification it is today. First and foremost, Monetary Cooperation Europe was the response to the challenges of creating an integrated economic area in the face of international monetary instability. With the collapse of the Bretton Woods uh, system and uh, when President Nixon uh, cut the US dollar's link to gold in the summer of 1971, it became clear that uh, the future world monetary order would be based on fluctuating currencies. Tying one's currency to the US dollar uh, was no longer an option. And if Europe wanted to be sovereign in monetary affairs, it needed to change its money itself. And this proved to be very difficult and I think it's nowadays, uh, in many cases, forgotten 
that uh, before EMU, Europe repeatedly experienced severe monetary crisis, crisis in exchange rate policy with very high economic and political uh, costs. These, type, these stabilizing of capital flows were not the only factor behind uh, this uh, failure of the different experiments in fixed exchange rate regimes that were tried in Europe. Instability also resulted from incompatible national policies. In the 1950s and 1960s, the consensus that monetary policy should target stable prices had not yet evolved. Cooperation between fiscal and monetary policies was limited, and mechanisms that would help enforce the agreed scope of adjustment were lacking. And the key difference to earlier decades and the crucial advantage that we have nowadays is that today we have institutions and procedures in place to help Europe to resolve these conflicts of former times while eliminating uh, economic and political costs of this earlier exchange rate crisis. Uh, our uh, conference is reflecting these uh, challenges, these challenges that we have today. That means that uh, uh, the euro area, of course, has uh, succeeded in overcoming this big crisis of 2007, 2008. But of course, that there is the need to make it more resilient to shocks and to increase its ability to act. And so deepening EMU will remain a key task for the years ahead. And this is one of the main aspects of our, of our conference. And so therefore today, we will talk about first the structural adjustments that shall make EU, EMU more robust in the future, the role of fiscal policy, as well as about banking union and financial stability. In the afternoon then, we will come back to the Euro's role as a bulwark in a challenging international environment, which reminds us of the concerns and hopes of the masterminds of a common currency in the 1960s and 1970s. As President Draghi said in a recent uh, speech, and I quote, true sovereignty is reflected not in the power of making laws, and this as a legal definition would have it, but in the ability to control outcomes and respond to fundamental needs of the people. So to ensure that the uh, Euro area is uh, effectively uh, able to shield Europe from future crises in times of growing geopolitical tensions, the European Commission recently proposed to strengthen the international role of the Euro and for the EU to stand together to promote its interest in sh uh, shaping global affairs. And we will discuss this progress here in the afternoon today. And tomorrow, we will then turn towards the consequences of digitalization for monetary policy before closing the conference again on the topic of completing monetary union. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude. The European Union is often likened to a house. I the line, a house, not a fortress. Uh, providing a house, providing home and shelter for Europe's people. I believe the best way to celebrate the first 20 years of the Euro is to, do, is to debate together how our European house can be adapted, enlarged, and refurbished to keep it ready for the next 20 years. I wish us all insightful, stimulating, and productive one and a half days here in Vienna, and want to welcome you very much again. I now want to ask Jakob de Haan, Professor Jakob de Haan, President of SURF, for his opening remarks. Please, Jakob. Ladies and gentlemen, also on behalf of SWERF, it's a great pleasure to welcome you at this wonderful event. 
some of you might remember the words of Martin Feldstein when he was talking about the consequences of the introduction of the euro. He thought that there was a fair risk that the euro might create war in Europe. I think with the benefit of hindsight, at least so far, we can conclude that Martin Feldstein was wrong. At the same time, it has also become clear that after politicians in Europe decided to embark on this European Economic and Monetary Union, not everything has been running smoothly, to say the least. I think several academic economists, not only Feldstein, have warned against um, the institutional setup, as was decided upon at the time of EMU. And I think we have to be honest. I think that, um, indeed, time has shown that there were deficiencies. Um, for one thing, um, I think that the so-called convergence criteria that were used to decide uh, upon admittance of countries into the euro area were definitely wrong. I think some countries were admitted too early. But that's all, of course, with the benefit of hindsight. Um, and this hindsight is essentially um, based on what happened during what I call the euro crisis. The official terminology is, of course, the sovereign debt crisis. But I think at the time, uh, the euro itself was at stake. And unfortunately, it took politicians quite a while before they acted. Um, and it was only, I think, thanks to the swift intervention of the ECB that the euro survived. I think after Mario Draghi's speech in July 2012 that the ECB would do whatever it takes to um, keep the euro, that markets calmed down and that the so-called redenomination risk disappeared. Um, and then, finally, crucial steps were taken to enhance um, the uh, institutional setup uh, of EMU. Uh, most importantly, I think, uh, the banking union was created. And I think that was a major and very important step forward. At the same time, in my view at least, the banking union is still not complete. In my view, what we definitely need, and this is not the official position of any organization that I'm affiliated to, what is definitely needed is to finalize the banking union by introducing, as quickly as we can, a common deposit guarantee system. Uh, and I would say, preferably, before the next recession will hit Europe. Why is that so important? Well, we still face many weak banks. And not just, as some people seem to believe, in southern Europe. There are many weak banks also in the northern part of Europe. And from that perspective, I'm really puzzled why some northern European countries, including, unfortunately, my own, are so hesitant to introduce this common deposit guarantee system. I think it's a major step forward and a major step needed uh, very quickly. I think at the same time, when we look forward, as Governor uh, Novotny has told us, it's important that we look forward. Um, and there are many challenges. Uh, and there are several things that also, when it comes to the institutional setup of EMU, need to be considered. And one of the topics that is uh, currently high on the list of issues uh, discussed is the question whether we need uh, a so-called fiscal stabilization mechanism. As you might know, the IMF has been pushing for this very strongly. And I think there are good arguments uh, to do so. At the same time, there are also many um, reasons why we may uh, be reluctant. One question, for instance, is do we really need um, a government stabilization or can we do with a private risk sharing mechanism? Um, at the moment, we have to be honest, private risk sharing in the euro area is uh, far below levels that we have in the US. But can we get to a similar level in terms of private risk sharing as the US? If so, how should we do that? Is a capital market union sufficient? Do we need further steps? I think these are important questions. And if, in the end, the conclusion is, yes, we need, perhaps, a government fiscal stabilization mechanism, then an important question is how to organize this. Because, for sure, we do not want to end up 
uh, with a permanent fiscal transfer, yet another permanent fiscal transfer mechanism in Europe. Yeah, so these are, I think, important questions, and I have no answers uh, to those questions at the moment. So that's why I was very enthusiastic when the Austrian National Bank announced their plans to have a conference on precisely this theme, the future of EMU. I think there are important questions, uh, not just those I mentioned, but also others mentioned by Governor Nowotny, and I think this is a great opportunity to discuss all these issues together. Let me finally say a few words about SWERF. Um, SWERF, the European Monetary and Finance Forum, um, is a very unique organization in the sense that it has three different constituencies. Um, and that's also reflected, I think, in today's uh, program. We have academics, we have policymakers, and we have financial institutions. Um, and I think it's important that these constituencies talk to one another in a meaningful way. And that means that academics should be forced um, to talk in non-technical terms, which is not their natural habitat, unfortunately. But I think it's important. Likewise, it's important that policymakers are willing to step beyond their um, standard routine talks and are open-minded. And I think that's precisely the kind of um, opportunities that SWERF offers. We have a lot of activities, uh, a lot of conferences, we have several publications, um, and in a way you could say that SWERF is um, a public good. Unfortunately, as you might remember from your uh, Microeconomics 101 courses, uh, a public good has um, several characteristics. Uh, and one of them is that everyone would like to enjoy the benefits, but not pay for it. <laughs> um, so in case you are representing an organization which as far as today is not a member of SWERF, um, I really would um, ask you to consider to become member. Not because it's expensive, quite to the contrary, it's extremely cheap. Uh, but we offer, I think, real money for value. Um, so please consider, have a look at our website if you haven't done so, um, see what we offer, uh, and please get back to your organization uh, and request them to become a member if you're not a member yet. Having said all that, I think it's high time uh, to get started with the program, and it's a great pleasure to invite uh, the Austrian Minister of Finance to give his opening speech, and I really look forward to it. And again, thank you very much for being here uh, and enjoying together with uh, all of us this wonderful conference. Thank you very much. So it was very interesting for me, Jacob, to hear in which form you're doing your marketing speech, uh, and you are a big seller, as I have seen. So. From my side, first of all, uh, I'm glad and it's a big honor and pleasure on behalf of the Austrian government to have the chance to, yes, welcome all of you uh, in Vienna, as you know, the most livable city of the world, uh, also announced uh, in this year. Before I start with my speech, I want to take the chance, uh, Ewald, you're sitting uh, very smoothly uh, here on uh, the side, so, because uh, I think all of you know that uh, Ewald, of course, is still in the responsibility uh, till end of August this year, but uh, in this form uh, to this conference, uh, we all know that it is the last conference uh, hosted by Ewald Novotny as a governor of uh, the Austrian Central Bank, and uh, I want to take the chance and the opportunity to say Thank you also in this format, uh, because when we now celebrate 20 years uh, of uh, EMU, uh, more than half of it, uh, uh, Ewald Novotny, you also had a very strong uh, input in this form, and the success of the story is also your success in the work, not only in Austria, also in your functions uh, in the ECB. And uh, knowing that uh, we are not always in line with our opinions, uh, for example, also regarding the supervisory authority structure uh, in this form to Austria, but I would say that your advice 
all the time has been very, very important also for politics in Austria. And I'm looking forward to seeing it also for the future, knowing that it will be important for us that we have your opinion on our side. So thank you, hopefully all for you. <laughs> we'll congratulate in this forum for Ewald Novotny. And this applause, uh, Ewald, is uh, to give you the power for the next month, so which will still go on. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure, as I said, for me as a Minister of Finance uh, to welcome you to this 46th uh, Economics Conference. I think that uh, such events uh, are extremely valuable, as it was mentioned already before, bringing together actors from different areas, one side of the economic policy, but also, as it was mentioned in a very specific form, the academia. Often we tend uh, to pursue our own agenda without looking around. And so this is the most important thing that monetary and fiscal policies are increasingly connected. And both uh, in theory, but as I want to mention is a screwed ideas and uh, some non-mainstream theories like uh, the current modern monetary theory are popping up. But also in practical terms, as the management of uh, the latest financial crisis has shown, economic theory must be capable of explaining new puzzles. And there are some questions which should be sent in that form. Why did, for example, the massive asset buying programs of the central banks not lead to a inflation, inflationary pressure? Or why did an environment of negative interest rates holders of banking accounts not spend more? And partially, it is rational. So monetary policy is, for good reasons, independent, and it would be fatal to run public finances isolated from our common currency architecture. You can't set up a prudent budget without caring about interest and exchange rate developments. And the benefit of this uh, today 20 years celebration of economic and monetary union shows that the benefit is twofold in a conference and an event like today. We are celebrating 20 years of the EMU together with distinguished guests and speakers. And they are very close to this matter, all of you. Therefore, we are going to enjoy not only a high level of expertise, but we will also hear probably some critical voices, and it was also done in the opening speech of Jakob. With an age of 20, the euro as a currency is still at its uh, adolescent years. I would say every one of us will remember what this means. Uh, this is evident on several fronts. It does not always behave as expected, and it faced crisis as a teenager. We all know about and it is not pleasing everybody all the time and it fights for its role among some peers on international and global basis. But though still young, it already performed in a positive way. Price stability, one of its major goals, has certainly been achieved. A positive impact on cross-border activity and thus welfare is also established. For countries like Austria, especially for our country, the list of benefits is much longer. The tax reform that we decided yesterday in Austria is actually a tangible outcome of uh, European Union and the Euro area membership of Austria. Thanks to the economic benefits and of this government's strive for fiscal discipline, we will be able to lower the tax burden to the lowest level since Austria's membership in the European Union. This will not jeopardize fiscal stability and thus also the public debt level will come down below 60% for the first time 
of Austria's membership in the European Union. I will tell you more about this reform in a second. Uh, let me just say a few words about the euro. The euro is the second most important currency in the world, as it was already mentioned by Governor Ewald Novotny. This in itself uh, is a sign of strength of Europe. And knowing that already 35.7% were on the global payments done in Euro. So there is only a difference of 4.2% percentage points to the US dollar. So we are quite near in the development to overcome. The latest uh, Eurobarometer surveys clearly show that the population also appreciates the euro. Around two-thirds in Europe are thinking that the euro is good for their country. In Austria, we are glad to say that the share is even higher. 76% of the Austrian citizens think that the euro is good for them, and we are, of course, uh, still working on it, that this level will increase. But what will the future hold? We cannot know for sure, but as one member sadly decided to leave the European Union, at the same time, the influence of the euro area in the EU further increases. 19 out of 27 member states share one common currency, representing 340 million out of around 450 million people. And there are two other countries preparing for joining the euro area. This is actually good news because there's a lot of work ahead, as it was already mentioned. Issues we are partly going to talk and hear about later during this conference. It is mentioned already the completing of the Banking and Capital Markets Union as one of the big and main pillars of uh, also the deepening of the EMU, finding ways to improve also the resilience, including by Eurozone budgets, enlarging the Euro area in a sustainable way, enhancing the international role of the Euro, solving the productivity puzzle, reaping the benefits of digitalization, which is in the development of technology, one of the main factors on global basis, realizing a uniform external representation to speak with one voice also in the long term, which is not done already. Let me also take some short remarks on only one of these. As finance minister, fiscal policy is of course closer to me than monetary policy. Currently, we are negotiating a new multi-annual financial framework, the so-called MFF, and within this new EU budget for the next years as a strategic framework, a new instrument for convergence and competitiveness is in the making for the euro area. It is a very delicate discussion we are doing on Eurogroup level, and the details are not finalized now. If this instrument will be well designed and balanced, uh, it could contribute to a more efficient and resilient uh, economic area. It would supplement European monetary policy. Shocks may be smoothed and convergence may be fostered. But if the wrong incentives outweigh the positive ones, the instrument could do the opposite. And so we have to take care in which form we will implement and create and work out this instrument. These are the kind of topics where politicians need the help of academia. And they will be discussed in this conference in the coming two days. And I'm really looking forward that we will have a common output. And uh, so let me now also come back to the tax reform, which is currently uh, the most important factor in the Austrian politics this week. And we presented yesterday uh, also on official form and we decided in governmental formally yesterday about this important reform. The tax reform uh, in the name of Entlastung Österreich, so the relief 
for Austria is not merely a tax reform uh, as it own. So it is a comprehensive relief program which is running over some years, uh, which is also designed to relieve those who do not pay tax at the moment. The program includes uh, relief measures for all Austrian citizens, enterprise and also investment incentives, but also an introduction of many simplifications to have a smoother and a better form of taxation in Austria. The citizens will be better off and businesses will have more funds for investments as well as new workplaces. So relief for Austria means the redistribution of 6.5 billion euros from the state to the citizens and the businesses. If the family bonus, which has been already implemented this year, uh, together these relief measures are added, it's a high of about 8.3 billion euro of relief. The main beneficiaries will be low and medium earners, so this is a very important factor to have on this part. Also, the Austrian small and medium enterprises will be in the focus of the first steps. The labor factor will be relieved by around 5 billion euros per year, so 75% of the total amount are going into the low and medium earners. And from the social security bonus, which will be also for the non-taxpayers, we have another 900 million euros per year in a relief. We are therefore not only lowering taxes, uh, but also the social security contributions. And why are we doing this? Because we want to relieve everyone in employment, and in particular those on low and medium incomes. By introducing a monthly social security bonus, we will lower employee health insurance contributions for employers on one side, but also for pensioners. And why it is important is because social security contributions are disproportionately high, just as tax on labor is far too high in Austria. We are focusing our attention in this area also because the tax burden is very high in comparison with the rest of the European Union. In Austria it's up to 42 percent. At the start of my term in office uh, we had the sixth highest tax rate in the world. So Austria in some meanings is uh, very proud to be under the leaders of the world, uh, but uh, in the tax burden, I think it's not necessary to be one of the best or the highest. Therefore, we go even beyond tariff reduction and lowering social security contributions. Uh, long wanted, uh, but never implemented in Austria until now, we also enable businesses to pay a 15th salary, we call it in that form. We do this by making company profit distributions up to 3,000 euros completely tax-free for the employees. Especially in view of the high tax and contributions ratio, we also put in place economic measures amounting over 1.5 billion euros, for instance, through the lowering of corporate tax and an increase of the basic tax-free income. We create, out of these investment uh, incentives, for instance, by raising the limit of low-value assets and extending the research premium. Further, there will be steering incentives for environmental measures. For instance, through tax concessions for vehicles with low pollution levels. Or tax concessions for biogas, hydrogen and LNG. Another important point is the simplification of taxation law because uh, some uh, important players on the Austrian market, uh, they told me as a Minister of Finance, it's nice if you are decreasing the tax burden, but it would, would be nicer even if you, uh, yes, will help us to also decrease the level of nerves we are spending day by day 
in the administration of taxation. And out of this, also, this simplification uh, is important. We had, over the last years, more than 160 amendments of the taxation law, and had, this all had become complicated and confusing, and it is no longer comprehensible. So our goal is clear also in this topic, to simplify and bring taxation law up to date, to make taxation law more user-friendly, also for all people and also all companies, and to make its application also easier. The structural simplifications are intended to relieve taxpayers by roughly another 200 billion euros. So my appeal is clear. We are on the side of the taxpayers and make it our business to streamline our own systems so that we can significantly relieve our citizens and increase their living standards. It is not a tax reform that merely shifts funds from one side of the desks to the other. It is a tax reform with fairness as its base and also its most important distinguishing characteristic is that it will not entail making any new debts. All these reliefs, monetary as well as bureaucratic, are backed by sound counterfinancing. This matters to me as finance minister. We will implement the first tax reform without making additional debt. So you know why this uh, is important. The debts we incur today, and this is, I think, uh, all over the world the same, will burden us for decades and will burden our children and grandchildren, and it is not fair to do it in that form. So debts we incur today will be carried by our children, and so our existing interest payments are higher than our expenditure for nursery schools, for example, and primary schools in combination. And uh, another example is, uh, at the same time, it's nearly twice as high as our expenditure for all universities we have in Austria. So these factors have to be taken also in, into account when one in, instigates uh, tax reforms like this one. This is what we determined last week at the Ministerial Council. No new debts for Austria. And we will stick by that. All ministries will be required to tighten their belts and the incoming discussions about budget will be even harder, but I think it is in a common sense. Yes, counterfinancing is ambitious, uh, but the last budget has proved that we are a government that saves money by streamlining its own systems. The creator of no new taxes and no new debts makes this tax reform a reform with a common sense and it is based and it is an expression of our determination not to do politics at the expense of next generations. That's what I stand for as a finance minister of Austria, and that's what this entire government stands for. Let me come full circle and get back to the currency union. Countries like Austria, we have greatly profited it from being part of the European Union and being part of Eurogroup. This was the prerequisite for the success of these tax reforms. Otherwise, it would not be possible to do it in this way. Other countries still have to do some homework to reap the benefits. But also for those, I'm convinced that the costs of the crisis would have been even higher. And out of this, I wish all of you uh, an interesting and fruitful time in Vienna. Good discussion about the benefit of the euro. And I think this will accompany us as our currency also in a hopefully peaceful and prosperous future to the whole European countries. Thank you very much and all the best to the conference of EMU. Thank you very much.
Dear Minister of Finance, dear Hartwig, thank you very much for this uh, very uh, interesting presentation. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, you gave a lot of uh, food, food for thought for many of our foreign guests that we have around here. Uh, and uh, knowing, of course, uh, as economists, that uh, the fate of a budget depends very much on the fate of the economy, we wish you and we wish for us all the best for our future economic developments so that all these, uh, I think, very interesting perspectives uh, have the economic basis that we all hope for. Uh, we have now the chance and the good opportunity uh, to meet again one of the great friends of the Austrian Central Bank, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet is, uh, uh, has been from 2003 to 2011 president of the European Central Bank. He was governor of the Banque de France in 1993 uh, to 2003, under secretary of the French Treasury uh, 1987 to 1993, president of the Paris Club, this is about debt rescheduling, and he was president of the European Monetary Committee for some time, so that means he was really also uh, very much involved in the preparation uh, for, of, the, of the Euro. Uh, it is of great pleasure for us to have you here. I may say that as a member of the uh, governing council for now 11 years, I have been a great support and admirer uh, of Jean-Claude uh, Trichet. I was also Im always impressed by his leadership qualities, uh, by his uh, really encompassing economic perspective, and if I may say so, by his uh, European patriotism, a patriotism in the right way of the world, not chauvinistic, but for the best of the people we are working for. So very, very, thank you very much for coming. Welcome in Vienna, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for this uh, invitation. Each time I am in Vienna, I feel happy uh, and uh, impressed by, uh, by the culture and by the beauty of the city. Dear Minister, I was very impressed by the figures you gave on the Eurobarometer uh, support uh, of uh, the Austrian people for uh, the Euro and for the belonging to the Euro area. Uh, dear Governor Novotny, I remember that you came in the governing council the 1st of September 2008 with a sense of anticipation that was absolutely remarkable. 15 days afterwards, we had the collapse of Lehman Brothers and we had to take incredible decisions in real time, generalizing full allotment at fixed rates all over the euro area, uh, decreasing rates in coordination with the other major central banks, and I have also the very vivid memory of the decisions we took together. You were in the governing council to purchase treasuries of Greece, Ireland, and Portugal in May 2010. Had we not done that, we would have already observed the explosion of uh, uh, our uh, entity, the euro area. We blocked the speculation that was going on, and we did the same in August 2011 uh, in uh, purchasing uh, massively treasuries of Spain and Italy. These were very difficult decisions to take, extremely difficult decisions. They were highly criticized at the time, and we took those decisions in a very sh short span of time because we considered we could not let things go and let, by the way, the transmission of monetary policy being hampered dramatically in the euro area at the time. That was the justification for what we'd done, and uh, the history has uh, given a lot of, uh, of uh, justification for these very difficult decisions, again, taken in a swift and bold manner by yourself, if I may, dear governor, and uh, by all of us. Let me also say that I am so happy to see a lot of friends here, the former governor of the uh, institution, 
which is inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here and all the uh, dear friends that I see in the room. It's a, a honor also to be invited, not only by the National Bank of Austria, but in cooperation with SURF to participate in this conference. I, like the minister, I admire the uh, marketing capacity of uh, yourself, uh, President Dehan, at the end of your speech. It was remarkable. So let me uh, say that uh, my intention is to uh, make three points as rapidly as possible. The first point would be that contrary to many negative predictions, I'm sorry to refer to the negative predictions, but some of them were mentioned by Martin Feldstein in particular, a good friend, but with negative prediction, if I may. Uh, but having participated in the negotiation of the Euro, in the setting up of the Euro, and uh, being associated uh, with uh, this uh, extraordinary endeavor, I have the memory of all what was said uh, when my best friends were telling me, you will not be credible, you will not be stable, you will not prove resilience. It is a nice experience which uh, deserves certainly uh, that we pay homage to your courage and your boldness, but forget about a long-term endeavor. And uh, I will make the point that uh, I think this was wrong. Uh, I also so, uh, think that the Euro area is more of a success in terms of real growth measured during the period starting with the inception of the Euro, then it is generally recognized, even if we have a lot of uh, hard work to do. And uh, the third point would be that in a medium and long-term perspective, uh, EMU calls for very significantly reinforcing its economic, fiscal, and financial governance. And it seems to me that all speakers uh, until now have uh, made the point that uh, we were, it's a process, it's a process which is going on. It is not, of course, an achieved entity. Let me remind all of us that the single market with a single currency of the United States of America was not achieved in a short span of time, certainly not in 20 years, and not also in 40 years, because the perspective that we have now is the next 20 years. Uh, since the Coinage Act of 1792 to the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, there is a maturing process of around 120 years in the US. And since the issuance of the first federal note in 1914, and today you can add an additional period of 105 years. It is in this long-term perspective that we have to consider what is going on in Europe today. Now, let me mention the uh, credibility. Uh, I will not insist on that. I was told you will not be credible and you will not have on the international stage what you are aiming at. I will only mention one particular figure because it struck me in terms of global payment currency, the euro represents 35%, approximately 10 times the percentage for the yen, but not so far from the US dollar with 39.9%. This is uh, in the document, uh, the international role of the euro, which is published by the ECB in June 18. So we are still, of course, uh, under the uh, level of the dollar by one third, in particular for the reserve currency, the amount of foreign exchange reserves, and also for uh, the, uh, uh, the international debt outstanding. But again, in terms of global payment currency, we have a position which has to be uh, stressed. In terms of stability, I will only mention that we were uh, considered very, very likely to be incapable to deliver a stable and credible currency because, let me, let, let, let's be blunt, we were merging the Austrian shilling, the DM, the Gilder, the Drachma, the Peseta, the Escudo. And I will stop there. Uh, I will put certainly my own currency in the category of the first. But that being said, the general uh, I would say vision was that you will have an average currency, a currency which would be the average of the credibility and the capacity to maintain their value of the 
uh, currencies that were merged. And it is not at all what happened as we all know. So that's something which uh, I must say is extremely important. And uh, I uh, would uh, uh, mention the fact that the, the fact that we have a better result in terms of price stability over 20 years than any of the previous currencies uh, over the 40 years before the euro is something which is quite extraordinary. Uh, a word also on stability taken from the uh, crisis standpoint. Uh, I experienced myself uh, that many colleagues in 2010, 2011, where uh, after the start of the sovereign risk crisis, we are considering that we, we would explode, we would be dismantled. And I think that uh, what they did not understand, my interlocutors at the time, and I'm speaking of interlocutors on the other side of the Atlantic mainly, they considered that all countries were in a crisis situation, which was not the case, of course. Five countries were in a crisis situation, not the other countries. And uh, that, of course, might explain uh, more easily than is usually done the fact that the euro being the currency that was uh, the single currency for all countries concerned uh, was not uh, hurt as they would have uh, anticipated. Also, uh, the uh, mistake, the main mistake which was made was to consider that we would be incapable to resist the crisis and to take appropriate decisions. And uh, we clearly took a lot of decisions in the crisis. Stability and Growth Pact was reinforced. Fiscal Stability Treaty was signed and ratified. Macroeconomic imbalance procedure was set up out uh, from scratch. Banking Union was created and the European Stability Mechanism Treaty signed and ratified. So a lot of weaknesses that appeared in the crisis were corrected, partially, of course, but corrected in real time. That was not anticipated. The fact that we would be able to have two new treaties in the time of the crisis was something which was uh, clearly not uh, anticipated. And uh, the third mistake was uh, to neglect the attachment of the people in the euro area to the single currency. And that was very usually done, I have to say, seen from New York, Washington, and also from London. The, the attachment of the European people, the continent, uh, to, to the euro was not perceived because the experience uh, in, uh, seen again from uh, New York and London would be that normally we should have rejected the euro in the time. Let me only mention, to make a long story short, the fact that we were 15 countries at the moment of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers. The 15 are still there. And four new countries got in, so that we are 19 today. But they got in after Lehman Brothers collapse, namely after the start of the worst financial crisis and economic crisis uh, since uh, World War II, could have been the worst financial crisis since World War I, had we not taken, as I said, swift and bold decisions on the side of the central banks, and also, of course, taken by governments. So uh, I, my last point would, would certainly be to mention that popular support, because uh, uh, the Eurobarometer was mentioned if one doesn't look very carefully to the Eurobarometer, one can have a lot of difficulty to understand what's going on in Europe, I would say, uh, in uh, continental Europe. Uh, I will say also, uh, mention also a few words. Uh, it was already said that the Euro was supported. The minister was very eloquent on that and, and also uh, uh, Novotny. Uh, the government of the team, sorry. Uh, but uh, we, have, uh, we have also comparisons which are striking. And I say that in front of the, of the minister, I, d I don't take that uh, uh, government or, uh, or parliament in Austria have no confidence. But if I take the euro area as a whole, when I compare confidence in the European parliament with confidence in national parliaments, 
I have 48% versus 35% of confidence, highly surprisingly in my eyes, because the European Parliament is not supposed to have a lot of trust. And overall, 39% versus 58% for no confidence. This means a difference of plus 9% for European Parliament and minus 23% for national parliaments. So there is something there which is important. Uh, I would say the frustration of our population all over the advanced economy, including, of course, in the euro area, is directed more vis-à-vis -vis the national institutions than vis-à-vis -vis the European institutions. And this is not observed in the UK. So there is a big difference between the UK from that standpoint in the perception of our fellow citizens and uh, in continental Europe. The same for, paradoxically also, the European Commission and national governments. 43% versus 35 for confidence and 39 versus 50, 59 for no confidence. Namely, uh, plus 4% for the Commission and approximately minus 20 for national governments. So you, you see the big difference that we see. In my opinion, we should we are all living in democracies. So to understand the resilience of the European endeavor, of the strategic, long-term, very long-term European endeavor, you have to refer to this uh, uh, difference, which is made the frustration of our fellow citizens that exist in all advanced economy is more directed against the national institutions than against the European institutions. I don't insist on the support of the euro. It was already done extremely well. I would like to say just a few words also very rapidly on real growth, because uh, usually when I am uh, eloquent, as I try to be, <laughs> on the resilience, stability, and uh, capacity to hold in the worst financial crisis since World War II, uh, my interlocutors are accepting my arguments, and, but they are saying still, of course, in terms of real growth, you are absolutely miserable, and there you have a failure, obviously. It's a little bit more complex than that. When I take the um, IMF data mapper and I look at the uh, GDP per capita uh, in the World Economic Outlook, the last publication, I see not a significant difference between growth per capita, per capita, between the US and the euro area. And uh, the World Bank is giving, giving more or less the same uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, for, from the World Bank, it is a yearly growth per capita of 1.2% in the US since the setting up of the euro until the last figures, and 1.1% in the euro area. So the difference is quite major. And, uh, of course, the perception is not the same because uh, there is a tendency, of course, to take absolute growth, not growth per capita. And there is a difference of uh, demographics uh, uh, dynamics, uh, which is uh, around 0.7% between the U.S. and the euro area. But the, the real comparison should be, of course, a comparison per capita. Uh, that being said, we are not as good as we should in terms of uh, convergence. And uh, this is something which is uh, uh, to be mentioned. Uh, when we created the euro area, we had a tendency to say it will play a very important role in making convergence operate uh, between the various countries, member of the single uh, economy with a single currency. And it is not what we have observed, I mentioned that en passant, with the countries that were in the first league, if I may, of uh, creating the euro area. There, you don't observe rapprochement between the uh, growth per capita and between the standard of living of the various countries concerned. And that, that is something which uh, we have to take into account. There has been some rapprochement in terms of uh, business cycle, in terms of financial cycle, but not really for the uh, uh, countries and economies that entered uh, at the very beginning 
in the euro area. Uh, so one has to recognize that the countries that came afterwards, so all the countries that were on top of the 12, say the seven additional countries that came after the first 12, for them, there has been convergence, and obviously they have uh, operated a rapprochement with the standard of living of the best and most important country. I had the curiosity to look at the United States of America. I already mentioned US, a maturing process of 120 years plus 105 years. So long term, very long term maturing process in a real uh, single market with a ring single currency and a political federation. And I was, I have to say, quite struck to see that the state of Mississippi uh, compared to the state of Massachusetts or the state of New York, according to the US Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, is in a difference of uh, a relative difference, which is more or less the same between Portuguese and Greek standards of living compared to, uh, to the uh, German. So, you know, it's not because you belong to a single market with a single currency that one has to take for granted, even if you have labor mobility, even if you have a capital market union achieved, even if you have a banking union achieved, you still have to count on your own strength, on your own decisions, on your own governmental, statal, in the case of the US, way of attracting and uh, promoting uh, uh, enterprises, jobs, and uh, also um, making uh, all what you can to improve productivity progress. I mentioned that en passant. It's not very popular to say that. <laughs> Normally, we say, uh, of course, we are not yet at the uh, end point, but we will do a lot and we will uh, equalize the standard of living. I think we have to be fully aware of that. Again, the US has a long-standing experience and uh, for me, it calls for much more to be done at the level of the European governance and much more to be done, of course, at the level of the nation states concerned. Now, let me take my third point precisely, which would be what should we do now? What is the best way to proceed at the present moment? And uh, I would list, if I may, the... Uh, uh, all the, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, element that I will take as being very, very important in the present, present circumstances. Uh, I will share very much uh, the uh, vision of President De Haan that uh, we have to achieve banking union. It, it would be my number one thing. It's already been decided, it's not achieved, we have to achieve both, I would say, uh, the deposit guarantee, which was mentioned, and the single resolution dimension, because there we have to achieve what was already decided and which is of the essence. I would add, capital market union is, and we have to remember that always, in the United States of America, the best way the states are protected from asymmetric shocks is not the fiscal transfer, it is the capital market union and the banking union. So because, because risks are spread all over the United States and the new credit are made in any particular state uh, according to a system which is pan-United States. Uh, it is not the case in, uh, in the case of the euro area and we have to do a lot more. But even on top of that, I have to say when I compare the uh, banking sector in the euro area or in Europe as a whole, and the banking sector in the US, I see an enormous difference in terms of restructuring, uh, reshaping, uh, profitability, uh, which I explain because they are still in the single market of services. And you would expect, of course, the, the banking services being at the heart of the single market of services. We have not achieved that single market. And we still have a lot of national hurdles to prevent from the appropriate cross-border um, restructuring and reshaping 
that would uh, that are uh, of course of the essence in the United States. So we have a lot to do there. Of course, the crisis created the sentiment that each particular country had to protect against the possible consequences of a new crisis. But again, it's a very important point. We cannot accept, in my opinion, to be lagging behind the United States and China as we do in this domain of banking services, as we do in the digital area. I mean, these are the two domains where the uh, anomaly of Europe are the most striking. Second point I would insist on, apply seriously and rigorously the provision of the two main pillars of economic and financial governance. And for me, you have the stability and growth pact on the one hand and the macroeconomic imbalance procedure on the other hand. And I expect the European to apply by the rules of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure as they do and should do for the stability and growth pact. Uh, number three in my, in my recommendation, improve the decision making inside the European stability mechanism. I mentioned also en passant, the Europeans are very uh, often uh, under assessing what they have been done, uh, what they have done. Uh, the European stability mechanism is the multilateral institutions with a callable capital of 624 billion euros on top of its paid-in capital of 81 billion. So we have a subs subscribed capital of 705 billion euros. It is the most important uh, multinational institution with such a big subscribed capital. That is something which has been decided in the crisis, which is uh, not recognized, in my opinion, as it should. Also illustrates very well the capacity of the euro area and of the European to make very important decisions when needed. But the decision-making process, which re relies upon unanimity, doesn't seem to me appropriate in such an institution. Fourth uh, recommendation, design a minister of economy of the euro area. I don't insist on that. It's not very popular. I take it that we need somebody to not to be simultaneously a minister of finance of a particular country, but to concentrate on precisely European governance, fiscal governance, uh, economic governance, financial governance, and uh, also representation uh, at the outside the euro area, outside Europe. The minister mentioned that. I think it's also very important that uh, we, we have on the executive branch, on, on the central bank, uh, side of the coin, you have this single representation of the system as a whole, but not on the executive branch side of the coin. I would also uh, think that uh, we have to reinforce the democratic legitimacy of EMU by giving the last word to the members of the European Parliament elected in the euro area when there is a conflict between a government and the European institutions, which has happened in the past. Uh, think of uh, Greece and could happen in the future uh, if we are, uh, again, in very difficult time. And I take it, I take also the fact that our people are voting now and for an institution which is, has some trust, I, as I already mentioned, given by uh, our fellow citizens, I take it that it would be something which would be appropriate. I mentioned in 2011 the necessity, in my view, to have a Minister of Economy of the Euro area, and I mentioned also in 13 that maybe we could increase the, uh, and improve the democratic uh, legitimacy of EMU. Now, there is this idea of the budget of the Euro area, and uh, I will maybe terminate my, uh, my uh, exposition on that. Uh, it's a decision which has been taken in principle. When you speak of a budget, you can mention several different functions. You could finance uh, public spendings that are national today and would be federal tomorrow. So they could be the embryo of a federal budget. There has been some proposal in this respect. This is perhaps in a very long-term perspective, something where you could have, if we decide to do so, uh, defense, uh, common defense, common security, border control. I would certainly consider that border control, at least of the Schengen uh, countries is absolutely necessary and uh, we should have there something which would be consistent 
with the decisions which have been taken and also taking into account the uh, threats of the present time. Uh, a second vision of the Euro budget, Euro area budget could be the role to play an anti-cyclical cushion which would accumulate, accumulate capital during the, uh, uh, I would say, affluent episode in the cycle and uh, would permit to uh, counter the, uh, I would say, negative episode of the cycle, uh, particularly when it comes from a global shock. Uh, that is something which has been entertained by some economists. It's not very popular, as we know. Third, we could have a financing of uh, large pan-European infrastructure investment, technology investment, R&D, digital uh, sector is a case in point. Uh, that uh, is also something which is possible. And uh, the idea which seems to me to have the best chance to materialize would be to help countries badly in need of structural reforms in order to have an economy more flexible and uh, more efficient inside the single currency area. We will see exactly what decision is taken. The minister will take the decision. And uh, I know that it is uh, fiercely uh, discussed, not disputed, but discussed in the, in the EU area. We will see. There has been, again, a decision in principle to set up a budget. Uh, personally, I would uh, consider that uh, the uh, anti-cyclical cushion should continue to be discussed because we, we have the Stability and Growth Pact and also the macroeconomic imbalance procedure which normally gives room for maneuvering to each particular country. But if we have at the level of the euro area as a whole a big, again, external shock or a big and endogenous uh, shock, we, we do not have uh, exactly what we might need. But again, that is something which will be discussed and uh, we rely uh, on, upon the, the, the lucidity and the vision of the, uh, of the uh, Euro group uh, in that particular case. Let me only conclude, if I may, Mr. Governor, on, the, uh, uh, on a, a quotation of Jean Monnet, who said once, premature ideas do not exist. One must bide one's time until the right moment comes along. And it is the way we are making Europe at the present moment. It is the principle which was applied by the US over a very long period of time to improve and improve and improve the single market with a single currency. I think paradoxically perhaps in the time of the dramatic crisis that we had to cope with, we proved a capacity to continue to proceed and uh, to proceed in a way which was not expected ex ante. Thank you very much for your attention. Dear Jean-Claude, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting and uh, far-reaching uh, perspective you, gave, you shared with us. Uh, as I said uh, before, uh, Jean-Claude is a real European patriot, and you have seen this, both in this perspective uh, with historical terms and perspectives for the future. So I think this is a wonderful start. Of course, now it would have been a very interesting uh, position to have a discussion between you and our finance minister, uh, but uh, we will try to substitute this in the course of this, uh, of this conference.